Welcome back to Jacques in the Garden, and this is the May Garden Tour update. We're well into spring now, almost into summer, so I wanted to show you guys around the garden, show the things that I'm ahead on, and things I'm behind on, and some updates on things you've seen in previous videos. So I figured we'd start with this herb bed, which is really filling in very nicely right now. I'm quite pleased with it, except for this nasturtium, which I think I got scammed on, because I got these as a nursery six pack. I said it was the Alaska variegated trailing type, and it's clearly not variegated. And it's also just these very basic orange flowers, which I have plenty of those around. I, don't, I wanted the cool nasturtiums. So I've already ripped out a few, you might notice that. But the pineapple sage is doing extremely well. I'd say too well. Like some of you mentioned, it gets quite large, but I've never actually had mine get this big before until now. But it's been very delicious. We've been making herb waters with it, drinking it in like little cocktails. It's been very pleasant. The tarragon's filling in very well. The green onions entirely bounce back. We've harvested a couple of these already and they've been really nice. The cilantro has filled in very nicely. In the video I showed you how I direct sowed it and you can see I've already started harvesting it using the cut and come again method where you just come in, cut a bunch out and let it regrow. So that's fantastic. It smells really good. The dill is a bouquet type dill so it is now starting to create its flower and we've been eating some of the foliage and we will be saving these dill seeds to make pickles and things like that. So I'm actually looking forward to that as well. Parsley is doing its parsley thing. It's kind of a little stunted, honestly. So I need to investigate that, but we have been harvesting off that and eating that quite a bit as well. Thai basil, you could see we're actually using quite a bit lately to make eggplant because I actually harvested some of my first eggplant from the garden, which is very exciting. Tulsi basil, entirely lush and delicious, totally bounced back. And then these black pansies have fully come in now and they look fabulous. So the last thing at the end here is this giant bundle of chamomile. And we actually are drinking quite a lot of it, but it's produced so much that we're a little behind. So we'll probably have to harvest and dry that out. So that's the herb bed looking fantastic. I'm very happy with how that's turned out. So now let's take a quick look at something I didn't show you guys last time, I believe, which are some of these potted containers behind me right here. So in this little side area, what I have are a bunch of pots that I kind of never found a place for. And now I have found a place permanently, I guess, and that's right here. So you can see I have a couple different things going, some Tulsi basil, pineapple mint, this lemongrass, which severely needs to get cut back so it could regrow. And then as I work my way down, I have a couple tree starts that I bought for $10 that were only this big that I've been potting up. So this is a white Hawaiian guava. So that's growing very nicely. I'll have to find a home for that quite soon. I have two blueberry, uh, blueberry bushes here. These are both southern bluebush varieties, which make a lot of berries in our climate. And you can actually see an example of that right here. So I have this kind of netting on here to protect the blueberries from the birds. But this plant right here in particular, I wish I knew the variety, has been making a ton of these nice sized blueberries. And they're quite delicious, I have to say. And um, this other one is clearly different because it First of all, it produces an insane amount of berries. They're a little smaller and they don't taste quite as good as that one, but you could just see, I mean, I didn't know you could grow this many blueberries in San Diego. And I know you guys are gonna ask me a bunch what variety it is. I wish I knew, I don't know. It was gifted to me, but it's doing really well. So I'm very happy with that. And as we work our way down, this is actually a new home for my green stock. I used to have it sort of out in a far to reach place, which often meant that I never watered it. So having it here makes it very centralized and easy to water. I got the spinner base on it, which is a total game changer, honestly. It makes it way more functional. What I have here are two rows of lettuce, mostly romaine type lettuces and some of that speckled lettuce. And then I have three rows of strawberries, which you could see some of my starts are limping along, but if most of them make it, I could just replace a couple of those bare patches. And on the top two rows, I actually have some beans, which are just now starting to sprout. So that's gonna be very exciting. So these are the three kind of, in my opinion, best use cases for a green stock, especially the seven tier. You could do two bush beans per cell, you could do one strawberry plant per cell, and a lettuce plant per cell. And it grows really well, easy to water, easy to spin and control. That way it gets light throughout the day. As we go down into this last little section, I have a couple of my trees that I've decided to basically just grow in pots full time. Uh, up here is my bear's lime, which is Tefra's favorite. <laughs> and it's actually producing quite a lot of limes. So I'm looking forward to getting those sometime later. I think probably in towards late summer is gonna be when they're ready. Now over here is my 
I'll admit this, it's my third avocado tree. The last two did not make it. I think what happened was that I messed with the taproot too much and I had soil that was not drained enough and was too wet. So I said, okay, how do I get around this problem? And it turns out that I decided these air pots here are the perfect solution because you could see it's pretty much all drainage holes all the way around and it does a really good job of creating a very dense, rich root network because when the roots hit these little cones, they want to go out and then they'll air prune, similar to how the, like, the Epic Slick cells work and like a grow bag works. And it's also just very well drained. And the cool thing is that once I want to just put it in the ground, I could actually just unscrew this right here. And there's two of them, so I'm not worried about losing the whole pot. But this whole thing unrolls. You could unroll the whole plant pop it in the ground without having to actually pull it out of a pot and mess with the roots. So I think that's going to make an extremely healthy transplant in a year when this is fully grown out. The last thing I have here is my red silk pomegranate, which is looking pretty good. I think it might be a little overwatered with some of these yellow leaves, but overall it's filled in quite nicely. And this little unassuming tree here is one that I highly recommend anyone who cooks at home regularly gets and that is a bay leaf tree. So this is a bay laurel, and it's just like what you would get as a bay leaf in the store. But I'll tell you what, a fresh bay leaf from the garden is like five to 10 times more fragrant than those dried little bay leaves that you get at the grocery store. And you usually find this in like the ornamental sections of a nursery, or just ask somebody. It won't be very obvious when you go looking for it, but highly recommend that one. So with all that, let's go take a quick tour of this garden, and then we'll work our way over into the next one. So now we're over here in the south garden, and it's the south garden because it's outside of the house. But what you see is that I actually finished rebuilding all these beds. I've actually planted them out. The first one here is, is holding seven tomatoes, which you might think that's not okay, that's way too tight. You can't fit that many tomatoes in one spot. But the deal is, is that all of these are dwarf tomatoes. They have stocky stems and they produce the leaves more frequently. So this tomato will probably max out at this height and it'll probably max out at this width. So with all these seven tomatoes here, I'm not worried about it getting crowded. And you notice I don't have any trellis yet. What I'm actually going to do is probably put a single stake on each one. Dwarf tomatoes are so robust and sturdy that they could be packed in tighter and they don't need a complicated trellis, which is fantastic. The other thing I'll mention is that I interplanted some bas or sorry, not basil, dill here, alyssum, zinnia, alyssum, and some summer savory in the corner over there. So this will be a nice little combo of flowers and edible herbs and tomatoes. Now, as we go down this way, what we'll probably see is that this is the area where I removed all of my blackberries from. I fully decimated this. You'll see that in the video. But the things that I have going in here now are the um, green chard, the Costa, uh, Costa de Fin green chard, which I recommended in one of the previous videos. I have a sunflower. And right here where I have this burlap bag, is actually two rows of carrots. So what I've done is carrots take a very long time to germinate and they won't germinate unless they have a high amount of moisture. So by covering it with this bag for the first week, I guarantee that the moisture stays in. And then once they start germinating, I'll just take this off and they'll be off to the races. So this is a nice way to kind of make sure the moisture stays and you get your germination. As we come down here, I'll point out this kale over here because it's kind of interesting. You might have not seen this before. But these three plants were actually fully covered in aphids. And so what I did is I actually just chopped them off. Like I just cut off the top of the plant and it regrew a bunch of different kale plants and I selected it down to one that I liked. The reason why I did this is that by cutting it at this height, I guarantee that they get morning sun that's not shaded by the bed. And these now have insanely robust root systems because these plants are two years old. And so I barely have to water this. If I put new plants in, they would have been limping along all through spring into summer and they probably would have died. So I've heard some people have gone apparently six years doing something like this, but this are two year old kale plants and this is my first time trying it. And it's working really well. So if you have a struggling kale plant, maybe consider just topping it instead and see if you get some regrowth. At the end here are my two celeries. I replaced them. I think in a previous video, I mentioned how convenient it was, but I just put in two new ones that I started from seed. I started those back in late fall last year. So those are growing in the ground now and they're filling in nicely. Actually, as we come around here, we could take a quick look at the tomato trellis. So I, I did that video on how to actually trellis tomatoes and I talked about two different methods in this bed in particular. One was the trellis net like this, where you could kind of let your tomatoes get a lot more bushy and fill it in. 
and you can see indeed they're very bushy they're filling in nicely and they actually have quite a bit of fruit like this is the cherokee purple here this first fruit, fruit cluster has one two three four five fruit six seven eight fruit on the way <laughs> i'm a happy guy i love garden tomatoes absolutely nothing beats it in the front i have the string trellis system and they actually have a ton of tomatoes as well i'm pretty happy with how both are doing i haven't noticed much disease a little bit of powdery mildew but in San Diego, it's literally impossible to avoid. So it's not worth worrying about. You just wanna start successions and plant more tomatoes as the season goes. Down here, the overwintered eggplant bed has been refreshed and it's producing a ton of eggplant. We actually harvested about eight of these uh, last weekend and cooked them up in a delicious stir fry. It, you won't ever get eggplant in May unless you overwintered it. It just loves the heat too much, but now that they're fully established, it's a lot easier for the plant to actually produce and set fruit. So that's one of the biggest advantages of overwintering your eggplant. You get production way earlier and way more often. So coming down, you'll see that I trim back a lot of my tree collard. My asparagus is filling in. You just kind of let it sit at this point. And I'm going to probably sprinkle in, not sprinkle in, plant in six or so more plants in here so they could grow for next year. Um, but that's doing really well. Not much to say there. As we come down here, I've actually started planting out these beds. So in this section, I have my American Dream sweet corn. It's a very <laughs> classic name for a corn. And I transplanted them in like two or three days ago. They've already doubled in size. So they're absolutely thrilled to be in the ground. And I'm thrilled to get corn soon. On this back panel here, I have a bunch of runner beans and I have one per each sort of vertical string. So this will be a combination of corns and runner beans specifically scarlet runners, which are my favorite. On this little left patch, I have my red Russian kale. It's actually looking really good right now. I battled a little bit of whitefly when I had some neglect on these plants, but I did neem oil for two weeks and they've now fully recovered. So I'm quite pleased with that because I love red Russian kale. The last things to talk about in this garden are, I guess we could look at this grape behind me. Um, I actually built this grape trellis, a very simple one. I posted on Instagram about how I actually built that. But this grape is only two years old and it has over a dozen, easily over a dozen fruit clusters that are going to be set. So I'm thrilled because I've never had a fresh grape out of the garden. So that's a new one that I'm very excited for. And in this pollinator patch, my echinacea is actually going to be flowering. If we shot this a week later, we'd probably see it covered in flowers, but man, you have to be very patient if you want echinacea flowers because these plants have now been in here for just about a year and they've only just now set their first flowers. So not much else to say down here. I have a couple, one more bed to plant out. I have some more kale along that fence line. And then this bed here, we've actually thought about it and we decided we're probably going to build a trellis and put some cucumbers here because there's not much to shade out that's going to mind. So. Let's take a look at some seeds and then we'll take out, check out that last garden. Over here, you can see I have a ridiculous sea of tomatoes and they actually look really good. They're starting to show a little bit of sign of stress that they really wanna be in their final home, but that's gonna be what's happening this week. I don't, I, I was thinking about counting and I decided not to, cause I don't wanna know, but everything's looking great. I have some more squash, more flowers, peppers, lettuces, all sorts of things on the way. And I'm actually really excited to get this okra in the ground soon. But I just did a whole video about the seed, seedling care and all that. So if you want your seedlings to look like this, check out that video because I have some tips in there. As we're coming down here, of course I have more seedlings. Um, I don't know, it's a disease that I can't seem to <laughs> get fixed. But uh, here are my, all my eggplants. So I have quite a bit more eggplant to get in the ground along with all those tomatoes. And actually over here is a new addition to my garden which is the five tier green stock. So the last one that you just saw was the seven tier, which is great for things like beans, strawberries, lettuce, all those things do great in here too. But you could also grow things like peppers and these deeper ones, and um, actually like bushy tomatoes, like this is a better bush, which is a smaller, more compact type tomato. Tons of flowers. These are great for attracting pollinators. So I'll probably fill in more flowers. I have some sage, or sorry, not sage, lavender. And actually on the last tier, you'll notice it's empty. I decided to actually put potatoes in each one of those because I saw Van is in the garden on Instagram. She grew her whole thing with potatoes and it looked incredible. And she actually got a decent harvest. 
So I'm gonna try that this year, but that's what's growing in this right now. And let's go ahead and take a look at this garden. There's a few things that changed quite a bit and a couple of things that didn't really change at all, which should have changed, but that's a problem for this week. So coming in, the biggest change you'll see is that I have my first sort of peppers truly in the ground. I have two fully planted out pepper beds. So both these beds are entirely peppers, mostly sweet varieties, a couple spicy ones. Um, and actually this year I'm really excited because I brought back a bunch of pepper seeds from Bulgaria and something like half of these peppers are actually Bulgarian peppers that I'm really curious and excited to see if they do well here in our climate. Now, behind me is the container area that I have going until I get some more birdies beds. So I'll probably be installing a bunch of birdies beds sometime this month, but for now it's been really great for holding all these sort of extra peppers in containers, tomatoes in containers, and this fabric bed, which is going to be a mainstay, it's already here, so there's no way I'm moving it. But currently what it's growing is one, two, three types of bush squash. So things like Lebanese squash, squash and black beauty zucchinis. In the back, I have three different types of climbing squash. I have center cut, center cut, and early bulam, which is a Korean variety that creates like these avocado shaped uh, zucchinis, which are absolutely delicious. And I have some beans. This whole bed and actually all these grow bags got entirely dug out by a raccoon. So you might see that some of these beans are limping along, but I did plant them back in and they seem to recover just fine. And right here is my Cherokee X carbon tomato. And this is the first tomato of the season. I got two of them that I ate on a nice bagel sandwich last week. And it got me really excited <laughs> for summer because it's been too long since I've had a delicious tomato. Tefra's here breaking the rules exploring the areas she's not allowed in. But yeah, man, these are just my pride and joy right now are my tomatoes. And over here I actually have two dwarf tomatoes that I'm growing in a container. Uh, these are the dwarf tomatoes that I planted for my growing tomatoes in containers video. So these are gonna do really well here. But as you see, you can grow these in ground, just like the bed that I showed you back there. So the rest of the garden right now is kind of in transition. So I think it'll make more sense. We could take a look at this actually, Right now, this thing is a little bit out of control. Um, I think this was probably a mistake, but it's hard to say no to these amazing passion fruit flowers because this thing is, let me tell you, I think probably 50 plus flowers and at least another dozen or two dozen fruit. I can't even find them, this thing is so bushy. But I think it's a little bit too bushy. And what we might actually do here is cut off everything on this panel because it still has all summer to grow. And the fact that it's this huge already makes me a little bit nervous, but I know I'm gonna get well over a hundred passion fruit flower, like hundreds of passion fruit probably this year if I let it stay like this. So coming down here, last little bits that I'll quickly go over is my herb strip. It's kind of overgrown, needs to get harvested down. This no-till bed is going to get refreshed this week and I'm gonna plant all my melons like um, cantaloupes and watermelons in here, maybe a pumpkin or two. And this is my mini garlic bed in contrast to the bigger garlic bed that we'll take a look at out front. But everything here, the hardnecks kind of gave up on me. I don't blame them, this isn't their climate. So these will probably get harvested out, but all the softnecks have at least another month to go. But you might see over in the corner there is the new baby chicks. So let's go say hi to them before we take a look at the garlic up front. So over here in the chicken orchard area, what you'll see is that we have a couple new friends. And that's these three guys over here. So we have three new chickens uh, and they're a buff Orpington, just like Chirp. And her name is Saffron. We have a Pita Pinta Asturiana, which is a Spanish breed. Her name is Cookies and Cream or Cookie for short. And then black, back here we have the Black Copper Morans and her name is Midnight. So the reason why they're separated right now is that when they're this small, you kind of want to keep them separate from your previous chickens because they're so large that if they think that there's like a territorial problem, it could get a little messy. So what we're doing is we're keeping them next to each other so they could see each other. And we have this sort of temporary coop. I wouldn't ever recommend somebody purchase a coop like this to use for your chickens full time because it's just way too small. But this was something that we got for free off of Craigslist. We decided it would be a perfect temporary 
<laughs> perfect temporary home for these ladies. It gives them somewhere safe to go to bed at night, but it's still in the same area as the other chickens so they could get to know each other. So they'll probably come back over here in maybe another couple weeks. Um, but they're doing really well and they are actually way more personable than our old chickens. They seem to really like us even more than these guys here, which already like us quite a lot. So let's go take a look at the front garden and see how the garlic's grown over a month. So over here in the front garden, we have our artichoke bed and this one's, you can see it's starting to just barely open. So it's a good time to harvest. So I'll save this for dinner tonight. But as we come down, I have one, two, three, four, five artichoke plants. You can tell this one I've already fully harvested off of. I got about five artichokes off this guy. This was the first harvest off the one up front. And this one actually is trying to open up quite a bit. So I'm going to go ahead and harvest that. And there's another one on the way. So that's the nice thing about artichokes is that you usually get four or five from one plant. And if you harvest them early, you'll generally encourage it to produce more. But in this case, it's already hit its limit. It's done growing. So I'll probably cut this down to the base to see if I could get it to regrow. But up here is the garlic bed. And you could tell that it's starting to get towards that late maturity stage where the lower leaves are starting to turn brown and starting to sag more. You could tell that there's been some spotty watering issues here. It's, I don't have any irrigation installed up here, which is really not a wise decision. So the ones up here are clearly a lot smaller and they look a little more wilty. The ones in the middle and sort of that flank over there look a lot bigger and more robust. And that's kind of where the <laughs> sprinkler starts. So I know for sure it's a watering issue. But now that the leaves are starting to turn brown, we have about one month before harvest. Once I have about 40% of the leaves turned brown, then I'm good to harvest and let them cure. So we'll check back, I guess in the next month video, and we'll see how the garlic's doing. But that's all I have to show you guys today. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next time.